Howdy everyone. Welcome to class. Today we're going to talk about your engine's lubrication system. And I think the best place to start is what is the purpose of your lubrication system? Um, what does all that mean? So first and foremost, your engine's lubrication system needs to be able to hold an adequate amount of oil to help lubricate the engine. Uh, next, our lubrication system is actually going to help cool and clean the engine as well. I know I just said cool and you're like, wait, so the engine oil helps cool the engine? Yes. Actually, as oil passes through the engine, it will pick up heat when it comes back to the oil pan. Some of that heat's going to get dissipated throughout the pan. So yes, it does help cool. Um, just like your cooling system, except uh, this is sort of a byproduct of everything else that it does. And then also cleaning, right? So there's some detergents in our engine oil that are going to pick up some of the contaminants and are going to dissipate them through certain additives. And then we're also going to carry it through an oil filter to help clean all of that. And so that's why you change your oil filter every time you do an oil change. And then obviously this is the lubrication system. So it's one of its main jobs is to lubricate engine parts. So in previous videos, we talked about how the engine works, the four stroke cycle and um, how we've got pistons moving up and down. Even if it was a rotary, we've got a rotor moving. There are moving parts that are sliding against each other all throughout the engine, right? The pistons moving in the cylinders. We've got our crank journals, uh, rod journals and main journals that are spinning up against the bearings. We've got valves moving in and out of guides. There's a camshaft spinning. There's all kinds of frictional um, heat that's, that's going to happen and we need to reduce that by putting a barrier in between them, which is your engine oil. So it's going to help lubricate engine components so they last longer, so they produce less heat and we don't lose as much energy throughout that um, as well. I did already kind of mention it, but they remove, uh, or your system removes contaminants from the oil. That's your oil filter doing that as part of the system. And then lastly, we need to be able to actually deliver engine oil throughout the engine. So there's gonna be means of doing that as well, mainly through your oil pump and oil galleys throughout the engine. But our system has to be able to do that, right? The oil can't just sit in the oil pan. Um, it's not doing us, us much good there. So we need to be able to, to, to deliver it throughout the system. So now that we understand the job of our lubrication system in general, not just engine oil, but the entire lubrication system, all, all of our components working together to get all of this done. So the engine oil itself, I think this is a great place to start because whether or not you plan on becoming a technician in this field, you probably drive a car, whether it's yours or somebody else's, and that car has a gasoline engine, more than likely. Um, it, maybe it's an electric vehicle. If that's the case, then that'll be another class. But uh, that engine is going to need to have oil changes done every so often, right? And uh, whether you're the one doing the oil change or you are paying somebody to do it, I think it's a good idea to know what's going in your engine. Kind of like you should be paying attention to the food that you put in your mouth, right? That is your fuel. Um, engine oil isn't our fuel, but the engine oil help, helps take care of our engine components. So you don't just want to throw McDonald's in there, right? If you want that engine to last and you don't want to deal with uh, a lot of problems later on down the line, you want to put a quality engine oil in your engine every time you do an oil change. Same with your filters. So uh, first let's talk about the engine oil. There's a lot of questions involved. There's a ton of different types, right? If you go into AutoZone, you look at the oil shelf, it's pretty much a whole wall, right, of lubricants and you're like, well, hell, I don't know what to put in there. So there are different types. Um, there are synthetics, non-synthetics. There are different viscosities of engine oil. Um, there are different ratings that are meant for different types of engines. Um, I think one of the big questions is that I always get is what brand is best? Um, because I'm, obviously if it's more expensive, it must mean that it's the best, right? Not always the case. 
Uh, how often should your engine oil be changed? So there's so many questions that would go through somebody's mind before they go to actually buy some engine oil. Um, and I think before we ask these questions, um, or, or before we answer these questions, we need to figure out exactly what the engine oil needs to do. We talked about the job of the lubrication system as a whole, but what about the engine oil itself? So the engine oil itself is meant to reduce friction, right? That's probably its number one job. Um, reduce friction to reduce wear on your components and produce uh, uh, or, or provide more so a cushion uh, or a barrier layer in between two components. So if I had two metal components and I rubbed them against each other with no lubrication, we would be building up heat. But if I put a small layer of oil and I rub those those two components together, now we are going to significantly build less heat, and it's because of that cushion. Um, so how well does an engine oil reduce friction, right? That's, that's question number one. Um, our engine oil is also meant to help prevent corrosion and rust, right? Um, metal in atmospheric conditions has a tendency to want to rust. So our engine oil is going to provide a barrier to keep that from happening, or that's what we need our engine oil to do. We also need it to circulate easy. Um, and this is where engine oil viscosity comes into play and figuring out what viscosity is gonna be best for your engine. Because it's, uh, if I have an engine oil that can't circulate very easily, it can't provide very much protection, right? Um, I need my engine oil to resist foaming. So when there's a lot of movement going on, the last thing we want is a bunch of air pockets built into our engine oil uh, because air does not lubricate very well. Engine oil does. Uh, so when we start to get foaming happening, we lose that lubrication. Uh, it's also meant to help keep the engine, as I mentioned before, clean and cool. So there's going to be special additives that are going to resist foaming, certain additives that are going to help keep uh, the engine clean uh, as far as detergents and such and dispersants, where it's going to pick up contaminants as it moves through parts and carry it away and disperse some of these contaminants and uh, allow some of these contaminants to get caught up by the oil filter. And as the oil circulates, it's just gonna keep doing that more and more and more. Um, and also, one of the jobs of our engine oil is to help uh, seal our piston rings. So your compression rings are meant to build uh, or build a seal around the piston. So when it comes up on compression, we create a nice, uh, seal around the piston so we're able to compress that air fuel mixture rather than losing a bunch around the piston. Same with on the power stroke, right, where um, when we explode that air fuel mixture, we want a lot of that power pushing down the piston, not going around the piston. Um, those would be called blow-by gases as they get around the piston on the power stroke there. Some blow-by is going to happen. It's just there's a lot of pressure in there. And so for, um, for there to be no blow-by would, would be impossible. But we wanna minimize that blow-by um, because A, that's wasted power, and B, all those blow-by gases are actually really acidic and they break down your engine oil a lot faster. Um, so we'll, we'll get into more of that later. But now we know what the engine oil needs to do. How do we figure out which one is best for your vehicle? Where well, there's a couple of things that you can look when you're looking at a bottle of engine oil um, and comparing it to other bottles. Um, so first things, uh, let's look at some ratings because brand is actually gonna have nothing to do with uh, your purchase or should have nothing to do with your purchase. Um, this is such a competitive field that from brand to brand to brand, everything is pretty close in the level of quality. Um, and, it, and the reason for this is because of these ratings. So the first rating I'd like to talk about is the API designation on your engine oil. So if I was to turn uh, the bottle of my engine oil around, 
there's going to be something called the API donut. You guys can see that there. It probably doesn't want to focus. But that little circle there, and I've got a much larger picture in your Canvas presentation. That little circle there is called the API donut. Um, I think it looks more like a Pokeball. API stands for American Petroleum Institute. Now, this is a rating that's one of the most important besides your uh, SAE rating because the API rating on your engine oil is going to designate the quality. So that right there, you want to talk about, okay, what's the best engine oil for my car? Um, one of the top things you should be looking at is the quality rating on that engine oil. So in that API donut, um, if we were to break it down, there's a section on the middle right in the center of your little pokeball there's a section on the bottom and a section on the top so we're broken down into three sections your api rating is going to be in the top section so in the top section it'll usually say api service and then it'll give you a couple of letter designations uh, the ones in the picture here say sn uh, this one is also going to say sn on it if you guys can see that api service sn it doesn't want to focus there. But if you look in your Canvas presentation, you can see this. So it may say CJ or, or it, it's going to have an S rating and then it will have a C rating if it uh, qualifies. And wh what do these ratings mean? The S designation is going to tell you that that is for a spark ignited engine. So um, if your engine is not just gasoline, but any type of alternative fuel that's gonna require a spark for ignition for your power stroke, that is what the S is for. So this engine oil designates that it is for spark ignited engines. Maybe that is CNG, maybe it's ethanol, maybe it's gasoline. That just means that it is for spark ignited engines. The second letter in that designation, your N, is going to tell you the quality. How does it tell you the quality? So API, the American Petroleum Institute, is an institute that is uh, responsible for testing engine oils and their qualities, uh, their lubrication qualities, their emission qualities, um, all kinds of stuff. So they perform a series of tests and the engine oil is going to pass or fail that test in order to accomplish a certain letter designation. Now, the higher the letter in the alphabet in your designation, the better the engine oil is. The current one right now is SN. Um, and as time goes by, we go to the next letter and the next letter and the next letter. So as we continue, let's say as an example from when we went from SM, the previous rating, to now SN, what does that mean? It means that API had more tests involved and designated that engine oil to be better at certain things. So just as an example, um, a while back, I'm going to go ahead and say at least 10 years ago, um, we went from SL to SM. That jump indicated that the engine oil was a better engine oil if it was rated SM versus SL. Well, what made it better? Uh, the API came out with a test that determined um, if it passed this test, it was a cleaner engine oil. So they removed certain things, I won't get into it in this class, um, that were actually going to make it cleaner. So the jump from um, SL to SM actually meant that the engine oil for that particular test, each letter designation is a new test. Um, the SM test meant that it was cleaner uh, emissions. So when oil is left behind, when the piston comes down, there is going to be some engine oil left behind. That's, that's normal. We do burn a little bit of engine oil, even, even the brand new engines. So when that engine oil gets caught up in combustion, how clean is it coming back out the tailpipe um, or into your catalytic converter? And the jump from SL to SM was a cleaner emissions engine oil. 
Now the test that was uh, designated to go from SM to SN, which was the most recent one, actually meant it was a better lubricant. So the API had another test that they tested the engine oil with that actually proved, okay, this one provides uh, better friction protection. It is a better lubricant than SM engine oils. And when they first make these designations, like when SN first came out, um, they, they the, the biggest brands, mobile, um, and such, they'll usually come out first with the new ones. Why? Because they have the most money. And API, like any other institute, requires money in order to uh, give people out those or companies out those, those designations. So the large companies will usually come out with the latest one first. Now, over a span of really quickly, too, within you know a year or two, everybody jumps on board. Quaker State jumps on board. Pennzoil, Havoline, they all jump on board. And in the past, I'm going to go ahead and say eight-ish years. It's been a while. We've had SN-rated oils for a really long time now. Um, which is why we're, we're probably going to see a jump here, um, probably to like SO or something like that. Um, and that will designate something new, maybe a cleaner engine oil, maybe a better lubricant. I don't know what the, the new designation will, will say yet because I don't work for API, but it will consistently go up and up. And yes, there was SA rated engine oils back in the day. Um, you don't ever want to use an older designation on a newer vehicle. So your vehicle owner's manual is going to tell you this is what uh, API designation your engine oil should be. If it recommends SJ, you can use an SN engine oil. If it recommends SL, SM, you can use an SN engine oil. What you don't want to do is take an engine that recommends an SN engine oil and you're cruising down the aisle at Walmart and you see the cheapest oil on the shelf um, and you notice that it has an SA designation, uh, you don't want to use that. And it will probably have a warning on there letting you know not to be used in engines besides lawnmowers or something like that. Um, so you can use better designations where it's not necessarily required, but you should not use older um, designations for something that requires an SN so to speak. Now, what if it's a diesel engine? Then it may have a rating that looks something like this, so maybe something like a CJ, and much like your SN, right, the, the S was for spark ignited engines, the C is going to be for compression ignited engines, which we know is mainly diesel engines, right? So that C designation is letting you know that that's for diesel engines. You shouldn't use C rated oil on gasoline engines. You shouldn't use an S-rated oil for diesel engines. Now, some engine oils are, uh, they go both ways, and they can be, it, it'll say SN slash CJ or whatever it might be. That means I can use that engine oil for gasoline or diesel engines, but I shouldn't uh, flip-flop them if the engine oil ha or has only one designation for one or the other. And then the same thing, that second letter, whatever that may be, is going to designate the quality in the same as I just explained. Um, the higher the letter in the alphabet, the better the quality of engine oil. So that's API ratings in a nutshell. The next oil uh, rating that you should be looking at when you're going to purchase some new engine oil is going to be the SAE rating. So I would say your SAE rating and your API ratings are the most important ratings that you should be paying attention to when you go to buy engine oil for your engine. Um, because if you don't use the correct ones, then you are potentially going to create damage or excessive wear in your engine or excessive oil consumption. So we know that API is going to designate quality. And I will tell you that 90% of the oil sitting on the shelf at AutoZone probably all carry an SN designation because, like I said, it's a very competitive industry. 
if half the oil was rated SM, anybody who knew anything about engine oil wouldn't buy that and they would lose money. So they paid the API their dues and they got their SN rating. Now, before I actually talk about SAE rating, something I forgot to mention is that certain, um, especially smaller brands, um, or even racing specified engine oil, something like Lucas, right? Or, or even Enyos, um, but certain performance level engine oils may not carry the API designation. They may say something on them. Um, you can see here, and this is an older oil, but it says exceeds, here we go. Um, it exceeds the API designations for SM um, and so forth. So it says, or exceeds performance levels. What Lucas is telling you is that it does the same quality job as an API rating that was for this. This is an older bottle, obviously, because it says SM. Um, but they don't have the donut on there, letting you know that it is API certified. What that means is, a, Lucas didn't pay API for the rating. Um, so they can tell you that it exceeds that performance level, um, but part of that is you sort of trusting that brand. But another reason why they may not carry that API designation, yet it'll say it exceeds those performance levels, is because uh, some racing engine oils will have certain additives that API does not say maybe are clean. Um, so an additive like zinc is in a lot of racing oils um, because zinc adds a, sort of a cushion aspect to the engine oil. However, it doesn't burn very clean. Your catalytic converter doesn't like it very much. So the performance level, lubrication-wise, it may exceed that API designation, but they can't carry that API designation because it's not clean. So you'll notice uh, even Valvoline, a lot of big brands, even mobile, their racing level uh, engine oils, they may say will exceed API SN performance level, but they won't carry the API donut and certification on that one because of that reason. So just, just so you're aware. Um, now back to our SAE rating, because this one's a really, really important one. SAE stands for Society of Automotive Engineers, and there's a lot of things um, on, on your car and everything that are SAE rated. You're gonna hear SAE over and over again. Um, it's gonna mean the same thing, Society of Automotive Engineers. This rating, however, as it applies to engine oil, is going to refer to the engine oil's viscosity. And in a nutshell, what that really means is that the viscosity is the thickness of the engine oil, thinner or thicker oil. But really, if you wanna get down to it, the definition is going to really mean how easily that engine oil flows. So the lower the number of viscosity, the easier it's going to flow. You can think of like a thinnest kind of like water, right? And the higher the number we go in viscosity, um, so we'll say over here we've got a, a zero weight, uh, they, they, they're calling it a zero W40, but we can say zero W30. Um, let's say just one number, a 30 weight or a 20 weight engine oil versus a 40 weight engine oil. That number, the higher it goes, the harder it is to flow. So you can think of the higher it goes, you can start thinking of, of like honey. So if I take water and I take honey and I pour them both out, one's going to flow a lot faster than the other, right? Or think of yourself as swimming in a pool full of water versus swimming in a pool full of honey. It's gonna be a lot easier to swim in one of those and a lot harder to swim in the other. So why would you want a thinner or thicker engine oil? That's the question, right? Well, it has everything to do with how that engine was built. So it's really not a good idea to just say, oh, it doesn't matter what engine it is, I always go with a 20W50 or a 5W40 or whatever you know Uncle Bob told you to put in the car. You should always go with the factory recommendation first. So if in your owner's manual, it recommends that you use a 5W30, you should use a 5W30. Um, 
if you don't use the correct rating, then you're going to either have oil consumption problems or you're going to get worse gas mileage and excessive engine wear. Why? Well, the engine manufacturers, um, the people who designed that engine, know exactly the clearances between all your bearing surfaces, between your piston cylinder. They know um, your, your valve to guide clearances. They know all of the clearances in the engine. And based off of that math, they decided this level of viscosity is what they recommend. So engines that have larger clearances built between components are going to require thicker engine oils. Engines that are built with much tighter and smaller clearances are going to recommend much thinner engine oils. So you know, all engines are not created equal. They're all special and unique, just like you guys. And they require the recommended engine oil. So before I get into when should you change viscosity and, and whatnot, um, it's important to really understand what this rating looks like and means. So your SAE rating is always going to be in the dead center of your API donut, AKA Pokeball, right? So it says SAE, letting you know exactly what rating it is, but you can usually tell because it is a, uh, gonna have some sort of designation like 5W-30. Well, first things first, each one of those numbers is a weight. We, when we're using a number to rate viscosity, we can say that that is the oil's weight. Um, and that is also gonna tell you viscosity. Um, I have all these weird terms, right? Um, but it's also important to know, we used to use single weight viscosity numbers. So uh, my engine maybe would take a straight 30 weight and it would just be 30. That, that, the only thing it would say in there. Um, and what that meant is the thickness of that engine oil is that of a 30 weight. Um, and that means that it's going to, and any engine oil is going to be harder to flow when it's cold and it's gonna be easier to flow when it's hot. So a straight 30 weight is gonna be a little thinner when it's hot and a little thicker when it's cold. Well, here's the problem. Um, engine manufacturers realized pretty early on that the cold engine oil doesn't flow as easy, right? So on startup, we would have problems where the engine would sort of starve for lubrication. And uh, that problem would over time create a lot of engine wear simply on startup and that warm up period. So what engine manufacturers decided was that, okay, we need an engine oil that's gonna flow easy when it's cold, but not too thin when it's hot. How do we make that happen? So let me try to break this down so it's not confusing um, because it's always sort of weird to explain. We went to multi-viscosity engine oil. So we can see we have two ratings. We have a five and a 30 in this one. That W doesn't stand for weight, that W stands for winter. So the cold, the 5W, is the viscosity for when that engine is cold. The 30 is the viscosity of that engine oil when it's hot. How does that make sense? So the engine oil gets thicker as it's hotter? No. So, and this is all through additives and there are chemists that design all of this, um, but that 5 is going to, if, if we're just looking at a five weight engine oil, it's gonna be harder to flow when it's hot, or, or I'm sorry, harder to flow when it's cold, but it's still gonna be a whole lot easier to flow when it's cold than a 30 weight when it's cold, right? A five weight is going to flow better than a 30 weight, um, even when they're both cold. But when that five weight heats up, it's gonna flow way too easy. So what they did is they designed an engine oil that flows like a cold five weight. And when it warms up, it flows like a hot 30 weight. So if I had a straight 30 weight, it flows great when it's nice and warm, perfect. But it, it doesn't flow easily enough when it's cold. So we're gonna starve on lubrication when it's cold. Well, if I had just a straight five weight, it would flow really great when it's cold, but it would be way too thin when it's hot. So that's where the multi-viscosity comes in. Through science, we have an engine oil that has the capability of flowing like a five weight when it's cold, 
and then flowing like a 30 weight that is hot. So it really ends up flowing exactly the same or near the same from when it's cold to when it's hot. And we get just the same protection from when it's cold to when it's hot. So if your vehicle manufacturer, if your vehicle was made in the last probably 50 years, it's going to recommend a multi-viscosity engine oil. Do not put straight 30 weight in there um, because you're going to lack lubrication for when the engine is cold. Uh, so that, that's where the multi-viscosity comes in and, and that's sort of the benefit of a multi-viscosity engine oil. So 5W is five weight when it's cold and 30 is a 30 weight when it's hot. Now, with that being said, when is it time to up your viscosity? Um, people will say, well, when you start getting a lot of miles on it. If I have a Honda Civic that has, especially an older one, that has uh, 150,000 miles on it, that's still pretty much in its prime, right? I can take that Civic, especially well taken care of, to potentially 300,000 or maybe more miles on that engine without having it rebuilt. As to where a lot of uh, domestic manufacturers, uh, Chevy, Ford, Dodge, they are not impossible to, that, to get to that mileage, but it is a lot more rare to find engines that are not rebuilt and are at a 300,000 and more miles on that engine. So mileage is comparative um, or relative. So I don't necessarily like to go by mileage. I like to go by symptoms. Am I starting to have problems? So what kind of problems would you be looking at on a worn out engine? I might have excessive oil consumption, meaning we're burning more engine oil than we should. So what's average? I would say about a quart in between every oil change or every 5,000 miles or so is normal. So if my car takes four quarts of engine oil, and I do my oil change, fill it all the way up to, uh, if you watch the basic inspections video on our dipstick, right? We check our dipstick out and we can see, it doesn't really wanna focus in on there, but we got our low and full, right, on our dipstick. By the time it's ready for an oil change, um, which by the way, oil changes should be done around, you should go by your vehicle uh, manufacturer's recommendations. Um, it was, especially with a lot of newer engines, you can go a lot further without having to do an oil change. I don't ever really recommend going past 10,000 miles. That's really pushing it. Um, all my cars get oil changes at 5,000 miles. I can tell you right now that you cannot do anything wrong to your engine by changing the oil too often. The only thing you're gonna hurt is your wallet. Um, doing your oil change every 3,000 miles is not necessary. Uh, we're really wasting money at that point. Around uh, A nice rule of thumb is around every 5,000 miles is a good time to do an oil change. But like I said, if your re manufacturer recommends every 10,000 miles, um, I'd say you can take it to 10,000 miles. Just make sure you're using the recommended engine oil. Usually they'll recommend a synthetic at that point. But we'll get into that in a slide or two. So um, ev around every 5,000 miles, so let's say you did your oil change, you're at the 5,000 mile mark past your oil change, right? You go to check your dipstick, it is normal to be about a quart low at that time. Um, because like I said, sometimes we are going to have engine oil hang out inside the cylinder, even as my piston has come down, those scrapers may not scrape 100% of that engine oil down, and so some of that stays in the combustion chamber and we burn it. Like I said, totally normal. When we start to exceed about a quart every oil change, uh, that's gonna start to be excessive. Some, uh, some manufacturers will say that a quart every thousand miles is okay. I don't agree with that at all. Um, that is not a very well-made engine if you're burning a quart every thousand miles and your catalytic converter is not gonna like that. Uh, so like I said, about a quart every 
every 5,000 miles is average. If I start to burn two, maybe more than that quartz in between oil changes, that's excessive oil consumption. I can also tell because there might be blue smoke coming out of the tailpipe. My spark plugs are going to start to look shiny and black and fouled. Uh, so those are some indicators of excessive oil consumption. If I have excessive oil consumption, it's time to up my viscosity or change your PCV valve. That could be a problem as well. It's very, very common. Um, again, we'll get more into that one in an emissions uh, session later in the semester. Um, but the, the PCV valve can be... Uh, it can be a source of excessive oil consumption, so don't assume it's just your worn out engine. But let's say you've got a fresh PCV valve and you're still burning two or more quarts every oil, in between every oil change. That means you need to up your viscosity. So let's say um, if I, my, my vehicle manufacturer recommends a 5W30 for my engine. What does that mean? That means that um, I need to buy 5W30, and I'm gonna use a 5W30 until I get excessive oil consumption. When that happens, I don't want to jump to a 5W40. Problem is, is um, when it warms up, it is different. But when it's cold, it's the same, and you're still gonna get ex uh, excessive oil consumption, especially on startup. So if I started at a 5W30, I need to up both viscosity ratings. So I would jump to maybe a 10W40. Um, also, with that being said, I'm not gonna start at a 5W30 and jump to a 10W30. Because on startup, that might change viscosity, but when it warms up, it's gonna be exactly the same as it was. So you need to jump both viscosities. I don't recommend that you take a, a, an engine that was on 5W30 and jump to a 2050 that you're, you're passing a few steps here. So sort of go incremental, and as problems get worse, you use thicker engine oil. If you get to the point to where you're using 5W, or I'm sorry, 20W50, you probably need to start planning for an engine rebuild or a swap here pretty soon because that's it's just a band-aid on a much bigger problem. You're also gonna get excessive engine noise and stuff when you need to up viscosity. So. Those are probably the most important things when you are choosing engine oil um, and, and looking at what's the best one for your car uh, and type. And uh, this last one is gonna be the bottom portion of your API donut. So if you look at that API donut, there may or may not be something underneath there that says resource conserving or energy conserving. What that means is um, that engine oil is going to save you money on gas mileage. And here is the type of engine oils that you're going to find this rating on. Your low viscosity engine oils, 0W20, your 5W30, and that's pretty much it. Anything 5W30 and under, you will probably carry a resource conserving or energy conserving rating on there. Anything thicker than a 5W30, you're not going to have that designation because it's thicker. It's harder for engine components to move with thicker engine oil. That thicker engine oil does provide a little bit better protection, but you are making it harder for components to move in between them because of that high viscosity. So think of, again, swimming in a water pool or swimming in a honey pool. And so you are gonna get worse gas mileage because the engine has to work harder to move through those components. With that being said, it also means you're going to lose a little bit of power the thicker engine oil that you are running. So just keep that in mind. Um, if you don't have to run a, a 20W50, I don't recommend it because you could be losing power um, and gas mileage on that. Now again, a worn out engine with really large clearances needs that thicker engine oil, um, but unless you need it, I wouldn't use it because like I said, you are, you are going to sacrifice power. So with that being said, a 10W30 is not gonna have a resource conserving rating down here. It'll just be empty. Lastly, when picking engine oils, one of the biggest questions I get is, should I be using synthetic or non-synthetic engine oil? Um, and there's no blanket statement of, yes, you should always be using synthetic or you should never use synthetic. Again, it really comes down to what your vehicle manufacturer recommends. 
but I can break things down a little bit more for you so you would know why. So should you be using a synthetic oil? When? A, yes, if your vehicle manufacturer recommends it. So if you look in your owner's manual and it says you should be using a 5W30 uh, synthetic engine oil with an SN designation, then you should go and get an SN designated synthetic engine oil that is a 5W30 weight. Who cares what brand it is? With that being said, what, uh, what about performance? Um, when is it okay to not use a synthetic and, and such? So what are the benefits of a synthetic engine oil? Uh, if I have an engine oil that is a synthetic 5W30 um, and I have another engine oil that is a non-synthetic 5W30, their viscosities are obviously the same. They have the same SAE designation. They may both have the same uh, API SN designation, right? So what makes a synthetic versus a non-synthetic different? Uh, first, it has to do with their base. Um, obviously, one being a synthetic base, while the other is a petroleum base, a straight petroleum base. What does that mean to you and your engine? So synthetic base engine oils are going to be more slippery. So the viscosity may not change, but the slipperiness of the oil can change. So if the oil is more slippery, you are going to produce less friction between components. And so I can guarantee you that if you take an engine that's running non-synthetic and you put it on the dyno and you get your horsepower and torque numbers and you do an oil change and you put synthetic in there and you do another dyno run and get new horsepower and torque ratings, you will see an increase in in, in horsepower. Um, it may be minimal, but you're gonna see an increase because you are not getting as much frictional heat loss. With that being said, most manufacturers for new vehicles are going to recommend synthetic. And you should absolutely use synthetic until you shouldn't anymore. So um, let's say for a stock application, uh, you drive a 2016 Toyota Corolla you will probably be recommended by Toyota to use a synthetic engine oil, and you should, until you start having oil consumption problems. So when you start having oil consumption problems, um, you probably should move to a non-synthetic. Um, when the engine starts to get worn out, what will happen is the uh, synthetic, since it is more slippery, tends to slip past clearances and will hang around in the cylinder um, more easily than non-synthetic. And so you can get more oil consumption with a synthetic engine oil. So if I've got a worn out engine, I'm probably going to up viscosity and move to a conventional engine oil, not synthetic. So let's say um, my vehicle recommended a 5W30 synthetic. I'm gonna use that until I start having oil consumption problems. Then I'm gonna up it to a 1040 non-synthetic and those problems will more than likely go away. However, I may lose a little bit of gas mileage in there, um, but I'm going to consume less engine oil all around. So that's when you should move to a conventional engine oil. If I have uh, large clearances built into my engine, I may not want a synthetic engine oil again because of these problems. So the benefits of a synthetic engine oil is going to be less frictional heat loss. And, and that's its biggest benefit. Like I said, you're, you're gonna get better gas mileage and you're gonna get more power in the end. So use synthetic if your vehicle manufacturer recommends it, okay? It's not bad for it. Um, if you have an engine that doesn't recommend synthetic, you can sure try it. Um, and if you don't have too much oil consumption, then you are fine and, and you can get the benefits of a synthetic. But if you are having oil consumption problems, you may not even need to up viscosity. If you were using a 1030 before a synthetic, just switch to a 1030 non-synthetic and that may actually help your oil consumption problem. So that's just sort of in a nutshell, um, the, that would be the drawback of a synthetic is you may get excessive oil consumption because it is more slippery. Um, with that being said, I'd like to make a statement, make sure that you guys understand you should not 
mix synthetic and non-synthetic. What happens when you do is they will have a tendency to foam up, especially when you start to get a lot of movement in the engine. Um, they have a tendency to foam up and create a lot of air pockets and that's not good. So don't ever mix synthetic and non-synthetic. So what about synthetic blends? It's exactly what you might think. It is a blend of synthetic and non-synthetic, so you sort of get a little bit best of both worlds. Some manufacturers will recommend it. In fact, uh, Ford, for a lot of their engines, will recommend the Motocraft um, synthetic blend engine oil. So use that. But don't make your own synthetic blend by mixing half and half conventional and synthetic. Synthetic blends use a catalyst that keep that foaming from happening. Um, that you don't do when you're mixing them half and half. So just throwing that out there, synthetic blends are sort of in the middle. Um, they do carry um, benefits of, of both of them. Uh, not quite as slippery as a full synthetic, but is a little bit more slippery than a conventional engine oil. Again, they use a catalyst so they don't get foaming from that. Um, but those are your synthetic blends. So. Just wanted to throw that in there. Um, like I said, this video is going to, it's already starting to get a little lengthy, so I'm gonna go ahead and stop it here. Next video, I will go ahead and talk about all of the lubrication system components. We'll talk about oil filters, how to choose your oil filters, oil pumps, and all that fun stuff. So I will see you guys in the next video.